among the final verses in the Quran that was revealed most likely but not definitely but among the last verses is this one Al-yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al-islam deena Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said Today I have completed your religion for you and I have bestowed the completeness of my blessings upon you. And I am pleased with Islam as your way of life, your religion. Such beautiful verses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose Islam for us as a way of life. Not only that, Allah told us that He completed His blessing upon us, meaning through this way of life, Islam, every blessing will come your way from Allah. And that blessing is the blessing which Allah created the whole world to submit under, meaning the way of life of Islam is so natural that it fits with every other creation and the laws which Allah created this universe to be governed by. Okay, this is a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which means that when you follow Islam, the blessing of it is absolute guidance in three ways. In three ways. Spiritually, inside your soul. Mentally, in your mind and physically the blessings of Islam cater for all these three areas and Allah says I am pleased with Islam as your way of life this means that as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was revealing Islam to us through his actions and words it was not complete until the end of his life so when we look at Islam we have to look at the entire life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam we can't take just parts of it and leave other parts. Otherwise, the blessing will not be fully there. Allah is pleased with all of Islam for us, which also means that if you take part of Islam and leave part of it out, you're not going to feel that happiness. You're not going to feel that gift, part of the gift. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has completed this deen. It's perfect for you, alhamdulillah, in every aspect of your life. When you take part of it and leave part of it, you're not going to feel the happiness of this gift of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept for us except the best. And Islam fulfills only the best things for you. You have to understand that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the knower of everything. And since He is the knower of everything, the creator of the man and the woman, and everything in existence, he surely knows what is best for the man and the woman. Isn't that correct? None of you men here has, have been women before. I haven't, certainly. Our sisters haven't been men before. So, Allah, who created the man and the woman, he knows what's best for both of them because he made them. He engineered, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us, he created us. And obviously he knows what's best for us. There are three things that you need to fulfill and fill up in order to be happy. We mentioned them before. Who can say them? Your soul, your mind, and your body. Okay. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has addressed in Islam all these three aspects, as we said before. In body, we have something called fiqh. The understanding of the right and wrong in Islam, the, moral, the, uh, the right and wrong of practices, what's good for your body, such as your eating, drinking, sleeping, bathing, walking, standing, sitting, uh, working, right? All of that has been covered in Islam. Islam has not left anything out except that it created and made what? The foundations for everything. I don't want people to say, well, if you say that Islam has talked about everything and revealed everything, 
Why doesn't it tell me how to operate my Xbox, for example? Why doesn't it tell me, for example, how to make a spaghetti meal, for example? Something like that. Islam doesn't talk like that. Islam gives you the foundation, the basis of everything that you need. And from there, you can work on it, alhamdulillah. You can build off it. It gives you the foundation. So the foundation is the most important thing. For example, about the body. For example, about the body. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to us a diet. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Hasb ibn Adam al it is enough and sufficient for the son of Adam, for his body, a few bites, a, f- a little bit of food. If he has to eat more than that, if you have to go a little bit more than a few bites, then no more than a third for food, a third for water, and leave a third gap in your stomach to breathe. You know that common statement they say, Brother, fulfill the sunnah, a third, a third, a third. That's not the sunnah. The sunnah is a few bites. But if you have to and you can't help yourself, then not more than a third. That's the correct understanding, actually. And I don't want to bring... There's also the scientific aspect of it. Anything more than what your body needs turns into fat. And if fat is not used, it turns into lipids. And these are deposited around your body and also around vital organs in your body, which later on cause liver failure, cause heart attacks, strokes, and so on and so forth. So naturally, Islam is in line with what your body needs. And everything that's in it is in line with the what you need for your body. If you fulfill it, you will be in the ultimate physical health. That's the first part of happiness. You know, when you give a child a gift, at the moment you give them that gift, they're happy. Isn't that correct? And they want to exhaust everything about it before they get bored of it. Islam is a gift. And the first part of it that we want to enjoy is the physical part. Okay, طيب. everybody enjoys the physical part. Alhamdulillah, you've got to be fit and healthy. But then it's not enough. You need the mental part. The mental part. And Islam has addressed the mind. How to look after your mind. How to look after your conscience. They're the morals of things, right and wrong. You know, let me tell you something. Have you ever felt guilty of doing something? On the outside, you justified it and everybody believed you. But on the inside, you knew that what you did or said is wrong. But on the outside, you appeared in a different light. But inside, the guilt remained. Has this ever happened to you? Islam comes in and tells you, address your guilt, address your conscience. It's a gift, remember? So it's got to help you make become happy and enjoy. It cannot be happy until it addresses your conscience and your mind and what intoxicates your mind. So it brought things that are halal and that are haram for your mind. And it addressed the moral code of how you should be thinking. So when you feel guilty, I'll give you an example of how it addresses it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-ithmu ma haaka fin nafs wa karihta an yattali'a alayhi nas This is Islam. It says, what is a sin? A sin or a guilt? A sin is a guilt that you feel scratching at your inner conscience and you would dislike that people knew that about you. So you hide it. Islam comes in and addresses it. I'll tell you what a sin is. Get rid of that and you'll be happier. You don't need a mufti. You don't need any shaykh to tell you. Islam tells you already. What does Islam mean? Literally, linguistically, it means to submit. That guilty conscience of yours, if you don't face it and own up to it and submit, you haven't fulfilled the gift of Islam. Islam is about submitting. Owning your faults. This is morals. So Islam is a gift to tell you, listen, you will not be happy. You will not enjoy the blessings that Allah promised you in Islam until you understand that Islam in itself is about submitting to your guilty conscience and submitting 
to the fact that Allah knows and you don't. He knows what's better. Don't try to fight it. Go with the flow with it. Accept it. You know, for example, about this hadith. When you do something wrong, the best solution for it is number one, to own your wrong. That's the first part of submitting. And then to admit yourself the wrong. And that's when you can work on becoming better. Islam has already provided you with that gift. Thirdly, it's your soul. And I think this is the ultimate gift, which is the most neglected. People focus on their body the most. Is that correct? The mind, second. But the thing which people neglect the most is the ultimate gift in Islam, and that is the gift of the soul. And I want to take you back now to the time of Adam alayhi salam. A little story for the kids and a bit entertaining for the older ones. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam alayhi salam, first he made him into a body of clay, physical. And this is the part which we focus on the most because we see it. Is that correct? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started off with the lowest part or the most, the least important part of the human being, and that is the physical body. That's the least important. Why? Because you don't own it. You're not going to keep it. You're going to lose it. It's going to decay. It's going to die sooner or later. If it was that important, Allah will not let it die. It will turn into dust and soil. In fact, the carcass smells so bad and looks so horrific that you, are, you cannot wait to either burn it or put it under the ground. Some people burn it, right? So the least important is the physical self. Yet Allah tells us to look after it as well because it's part of happiness. Adam السلام, was made into a physical clay. But he was dark. The light wasn't there. Life wasn't in him. And Iblis, the king of the shayateen, he had a high rank with the angels. He wasn't an angel, he was a jinn, but he had a high rank with the angels. He comes up to this uh, big being and he started to kick it. He started to kick the mold which Allah molded Allah says for either so way to who when I have molded him meaning he molded the shape of Adam alayhi salam with clay with the earth clay he left it there for 40 days according to the narration and Iblis came and kicked it and felt jealous of it <clears throat> Iblis is made out of fire Iblis has a high rank with the angels why has Allah created this being out of the lowest form of material? The angels are made of light, according to the hadith. The jinns are made of the heat waves. And the human being is made of clay. Allah is going to create him and give him a gift. Why? What's so special about this clay? So he comes and kicks it. It has a sound. He knows we're hollow on the inside. Nothing special. And he used to say, for what amazing matter has Allah created you for? For what amazing matter has Allah created you? It has to be something enormous. There's something's going on here. Then Allah started to place the soul in Adam. Started with his head. So the most important part of your body is your head. He sneezed. The angel said to him, say Alhamdulillah. He said, praise and gratitude belongs to Allah. And so these came, became the first words that the human has ever uttered in his intimacy with Allah. Intimacy, relationship. The first words that of the relationship between us and Allah was the phrase, Alhamdulillah. Which means that if you want to nourish your soul, say Alhamdulillah and say words of dhikr. Allah's first words to Adam were, Yarhamuka Rabbuk. Your Lord gives you mercy. Not Yarhamuka Allah, Yarhamuka Rabbuk. There's a difference. Rabb means maintainer, provider, caretaker, the creator. 
You use it also for your parents or you use it for anyone who's in charge of maintaining and protecting something. Allah is the maintainer, protector, provider, nurturer. So Allah uses the word Rabb. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to make you feel that you are under His care, Allah uses the word Rabb. And when He takes away something from you, it's in order to remind you that He is your Rabb. So when He takes it away from you, remember you don't own it. Who owns it? Allah. Who controls it? Allah. What does that mean? He's the Rabb. So Allah said, Yarhamuka Rabbuk, your Lord gives you mercy. And those were the first words from Allah to, his, to the human being. No one else received this gift. The first words from the human was Alhamdulillah. The first words from Allah to the human were, Your Lord gives you mercy. Allah. What kind of a gift is this? First it's mercy, then it's this special soul. And there's this intimacy happening. Shaitan is getting jealous, he's about to crack his head. And then suddenly the soul reaches the stomach. Now he feels hungry. Adam wanted to get up and eat. <laughs> but his legs, they were still paralyzed. There's no soul in them. So he couldn't get up. And Allah said, خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ مِنْ عَجَلِ Yes, man said, Alhamdulillah. Yes, Allah, He gives him mercy. Allah is his Lord. But there's a problem. There are desires. When the soul reached the desire, Allah merely said, خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ مِنْ عَجَلِ Man was created out of hastiness. Now hastiness is the enemy of our intellect and the enemy of our soul, desires. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was patient with us. Then the soul reached the, the legs and Allah said, فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ Once I have molded him, listen carefully, وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي And I have blown into him from my soul. My soul. فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ Then immediately bow down in prostration to him. Allah did not order the angels and Iblis to bow to him when he was a clay structure. He did not order him to bow to him when he was only in his head, where the soul was only in his stomach, but when he was fully inside of him and the gift was given, which was the soul. Allah said, that's when you have to bow to him. We are not favored because of our bodies or our beauty or about how good we look on the outside or our status in society or how much we can show ourselves in pride. We have been gifted with a common gift, which is called a ruh, which is the soul. And then Allah completed it with the guidance of Islam. Islam is in order to protect that soul. Number one, number two, your mind, number three, your body, and all of it returns back to Honoring the soul, all of it. Because Allah said, as soon as I place the soul into him, bow to him. So it's the soul that Allah gave us as a gift and it's Islam which he gave us to maintain that soul. Then Allah said, And then Allah taught Adam all the names. And then he said, to the angels, tell me these names, tell me these facts. And they said only, we've only been given little of knowledge, Ya Allah. But realize, some people assume that the angels were called to bow to Adam when he was taught the names. Actually, they were, they were told to bow to him when the soul was placed into him. Intellect rises and falls. But intellect was also a gift. And the intellect of the human being was something which he did not give to the angels. Therefore, the human being has been given two things, two tools which he gifted us with subhanahu wa ta'ala and then gave us Islam to be guided with, the soul and the intellect. And Islam fits the soul and the intellect perfectly. Anyone who goes off Islam 
your intellect is ruined and your soul is ruined. Abada. It doesn't work any other way. Iblis became jealous of this and he refused to bow and we know the rest of the story. And then we were tested and so on and so forth. The first test was with Adam. A simple test. He said to him, don't eat from that tree. That tree doesn't even have a name. We don't even know which tree. Which tree? That tree. When you say to something that, we don't even know which one. Which one? Well, it doesn't really matter which one because it's not important. Because that's not the purpose. We'll show you what the purpose is. The purpose is to live the gift of Islam. Submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you trust in Allah. Because you know Allah knows more than anyone. Because you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is your creator and He's your Rabb and you'll only guide you to that which is the best. When do we refuse the gift? When do we start tarnishing the gift? When do we start, not, when do we start abusing the gift? When we start abusing our submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Disobedience. That's when the gift starts to become boring. Becomes boring, the gift of Islam. And that's when we complain. We say, why is Islam not giving me happiness? Why am I not guided? Why do I still feel miserable? The problem is not in the gift yet. The problem is that you abuse the gift. You need to fix it. You need to fix the gift again. You need to fix Islam. The Sahabas in the past, the Tabi'een, they used to say, and the Tabi'een, they used to say that we treated Islam like the crown on our head. And the world, everything else was like material in our hands. When the crown went out of place, we dropped what was in our hands and fixed our crown. Today, it's the opposite. The crown on our head is the world, materialism, and the deen is in our hands. When the crown, which is the materialism, goes out of place, we drop Islam and fix our material and then we complain. I'll give you an example. One particular sister got married after being in an illegitimate relationship with another man. The man embraced Islam in order to marry the woman. What's the first problem? What's the first problem? Became Muslim for the woman. He took the gift for the wrong reason. Does it work? It's not going to work. You abuse the gift. The sister had a relationship with him. Does Islam allow it? No. Why? Because it's going to harm you. It's the only reason, because it's going to harm you. Allah will not give you something. He will never, ever, ever make something halal that will harm you. He won't, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he will only make the haram if it harms you. Out of his love. Otherwise, we can't call it a gift. What kind of a gift is this? A gift has to be the type that brings you joy, not misery. So if Allah makes something halal or haram in Islam, it's because it brings you joy and keeps you away from harm. Adam ate from the tree and he was destined to be on earth, not because Allah was angry with him, not because uh, yani, there was something special about the tree. But it's that connection, the gift. Allah wants us to keep that relationship with him. When Iblis was able to play with his head, he abused the gift which Allah gave him. And Allah wants him to be stronger than the shaitan. He wants to be stronger than the desires. It starts with a footstep and then the next and the next and the next. And Allah wants to teach us that our curiosity is what makes us lose the gift. Because everything forbidden is desired. You say to yourself, the only reason it's forbidden is because there has to be something good in there that I'm missing out on. For example, if I got five boxes and I place five boxes here, five boxes, and on the first four boxes there are no locks, no locks, and I reveal to you what's inside of them and then close them. On the fifth box I had a lock and I said nobody is to open this box. And if you trust me, there's nothing special in there anyway that will benefit you, so don't worry about it. Then I placed the key next to the fifth box and I walked out. What would your minds tell you to do after a while? To open the box that has the lock. 
You know, it's like us. When I was a child, we go to the hospital, for example, and you see that red button. <laughs> you have to press the red button. <laughs> Why can't I press the red button? There has to be a secret. I have to press the red button. <laughs> child goes in an elevator. They press every single button <laughs> that's there. Why? Because you can't press them. Don't press it, they want to press it. <laughs> right. Sometimes you tell your child, you want to teach a one-year-old or a two-year-old, don't go near that fire. They see the candle, they see the orange, they see the blue, they say, oh, colorful, colorful. The child wants to come and touch the flame. So what do you do? Bring his hand close to the flame and let him feel the heat. That's when they move back. Oh, no. It wasn't going to change my color and rainbows in the air. No, it was going to do something bad. Isn't that correct? It's forbidden because it's going to harm you. And surely a parent who cares for their child wouldn't let them touch the fire. We have to press the red button. So the alarm can go off and everybody's vacated and patients can die. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. So my dear brothers and sisters, our curiosity is a killer. We have to take what we can't, we're not allowed to take. So you open this box and what do you find in there? Nothing. Then you go, damn. I opened the box. I feel guilty. And I didn't even get anything out of it anyway. Now imagine you opened the box and there was powder, gunpowder in there and it exploded. And you harmed your fingers. You're going to regret for the rest of your life. Why? You shouldn't have done it. It was forbidden. There was curiosity. Isn't it correct? So first thing, Ikhwan, brothers and sisters, if you complain that Islam is not giving you the joy, it's because you violated something of it. Find out what it is and fix it because it's impossible that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you a gift that will harm you. And the first thing you need to monitor is this, that the only reason he forbids something is because it will harm you. There is no secret. For example, Alcohol has been forbidden. Why? Allah acknowledged some benefit to it. He told you gambling and alcohol has some benefit. But their harm for you outweighs their benefit. It outweighs it. So stay away from it. Allah already told you, man, it's clear. If there's any if there's no good, he'll tell you there's no good. If there's any good, he'll tell you there's some good. Then people, when they intoxicate themselves with alcohol, what happens? They start to kill. They start to abuse. They bash their spouses. They bash their kids. They throw themselves in front of cars. They do weird things. They talk their inner guilt out. You know, you, you, you catch them out. Alcohol. So then you find some people coming up and they say, Look, you know, a little sip of alcohol is all right, so long as I'm not getting drunk, because Allah forbid intoxication. And if I take a drop, I'm not intoxicated. Take it, doesn't matter. You violated the gift, Yaqu. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say anything just like that. The Prophet comes and tells you, whatever a lot of it makes you intoxicated, then a little bit of it will be haram. Why? Because the first drop into your system, that little drop, and then the next drop, and the next drop, even if you drink in moderation, yeah, tell you, if you drink in moderation, you're okay. Wrong! From a scientific perspective, alcohol over time ruins your liver, even in moderation, bit by bit. And that's why you keep drinking, because it's addiction. It's an addiction, eventually. Brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah forbid pork. Why? Not because the pig itself is evil. You know, Muslims, they go around bashing pigs, killing pigs. A pig is, comes on, can be really nice. You know, I read in the paper the other day that a pig saved the life of his owner. Wallah. Owner had a heart attack. The pig went out into the street. Wallahi. And stood in the middle of the road. Then someone stopped and the pig walked towards the house. The, the, the owner of the car went towards the house and found, this, found the pig's owner having a heart attack, called the ambulance. Uqsimu billahi al -Azim. The pig in itself is not an evil animal. But why did Allah forbid it then? Why did He call it najas? Impure. Why? The pig is not impure for a lion or a beast. The pig is impure for you. So when Allah called it najas, He means Allah is thinking, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the human. Because the human is the most valuable thing to Allah. 
So when he calls it impure, Allah means for you, it's impure. If you eat it, it's not compatible with your system that I created. It's going to harm you. And anything that harms your body means that it is impure. That's why the word najas, that's what the word najas means. Najas means it is not compatible with your natural bodily system. It will harm you. For example, if you drink urine, God forbid, and no one will do that. It's najas. Why? Because it's toxic to your blood. It's toxic to your bloodstreams. That's why it's najas. But you give it to a dog to lick, it's not najas for a dog. Islam is a gift to protect you. Everything halal and haram is to protect you. We go back to this sister who married this person she was in a relationship with for a few years actually in a haram relationship. When they got married, a few months later they became divorced. Ajib. Years in a haram relationship they were fine. They get married in the halal, they get divorced. I wonder why. Islam is supposed to be a gift. Finally, they made up the idea to go halal. But it all went wrong. Do you know why? Number one, insincerity. Number two, when you get used to the haram, you've got to expect that you need time to get used to the halal after that. For example, this funny joke that one uh, sheikh I heard once, but it's great moral. He says, there was this janitor, this person who cleans schools. And this janitor had one job, to clean toilets and toilets alone. He cleaned toilets for about 20 years of his life. And all he was used to was the smell of feces, poo, <laughs> and pee. <laughs> Look at the young kids laughing. Poo poo and pee pee. He was used to that smell. And one day, listen carefully, one day, this person walked into a perfume shop and then he fainted from the smell. Because his nostrils and his brain was used to impure smells, he became accustomed to it. He needed time now to get used to the pure smells. Metaphor. When you get your soul used to haram, then the halal has to cleanse you. You need to be patient. It's like a sickness. It's eaten away your body. The medicine needs time to heal you. You have an operation, you need time to go through hardship. You don't say, what's this man? This operation didn't work. Stuff the doctor, stuff the operation, stuff the medicine. Let's just kill myself. No, it needs time, right? You need to go through some hardship, cleansing yourself. Isn't that correct? Like a person who gets used to drugs. They need to detox. They need to get the drugs out of their system. They go through heavy pain. Pain that feels like death as they're getting cured until alhamdulillah they're sober and rehabilitated and finished. So my dear brothers and sisters, this is the problem. It's, the problem is not in Islam. It's a problem of violating that gift. طيب. This person began to blame Allah for her misery. Why, 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 why? Ya akhi, and this was your choice. You made that choice. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا ظَلَمْنَاهُمْ وَلَكِنْ كَانُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ يَظْلِمُونَ It is not us who oppressed them and wronged them. But it was their own nafs, it was their own self that oppressed themselves. The only person who oppresses you is you. Allah does not oppress anyone. Now let's get back to the soul. The soul is your greatest gift. When you die, the soul does not die. Allah preserves him. Because Allah said, I place in him from my soul. Don't confuse my soul with Allah himself. My here is a metaphor. It's a rhetorical statement my meaning the special soul which i have created for this purpose that no one else will have a share of 
You know, when you say, you know, you say, for example, I care about this person, care about this person, care about this, but this person, this person's mine. What does that mean? It means that they are the most special to you. I will take care of them. I will protect them special. So when Allah said, when I place from my soul into him, it means the greatest, most special gift which Allah preserved that no angel, no jinn, no human has this soul except the human, no animal, sorry, has this soul except the human being. Okay, so it's not to say that we are created from Allah. This soul Allah does not destroy it. Now, brothers and sisters, you need to maintain and nurture this soul. How do you nurture it? Number one, with the closeness to Allah. The soul does not need food. It does not need oxygen. That probably explains why when you dream, have you ever had a dream when you're under the water and you're talking and breathing under the water? Has anyone hands up had a dream like that before? We are under the water, but you don't drown. No one's ever had that dream here. Ajib, I have. You have? You're under the water or you're in space and you're still talking and dreaming. Oh, I must be drinking too much water or something. No. Not drinking anything else. Bismillah. Anyway, anyway. The soul in your dream, it's able to travel the entire universe. It's called the Barzakh world. And the reason why it doesn't need air, it, it can talk and everything underwater and in space is because it doesn't need oxygen, doesn't need food. So the soul, that's my point here. So the soul, my dear brothers and sisters, you need to nurture it with something else. The nurturing of it is dhikr. Dhikr. Dhikr, which means remembrance of Allah. And I want to tell you this story. You've probably heard it in one of my lectures on YouTube. I'm not sure. But it's so relevant right now that I want to mention it. I have a friend, a colleague teacher who teaches with me at the school. This particular brother, very religious, very down to earth, very simple, mashallah. Every time I sit with him, my worries go away. And you should always have a companion who is positive. We were talking about that before. Optimistic, positive, because you become a positive person. Surround yourself with these types of people. So we're going to pick up his son from the kindergarten. As he was parking his car, the wheel hit the curb. Has anyone heard this story? No. Good. I feel good about myself now. It hit the curb. You know what he says? What would you say if you hit the curb? Huh? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. What else? What do most people say? Honestly. Oh. Huh? Maybe a four letter word starting with S or an F? Maybe something like that. This brother, he said, Astaghfirullah. <laughs> so I started laughing. I go, Astaghfirullah. It's just a man made law that you shouldn't hit the curb when you're driving. You say, Astaghfirullah. It's not Allah's law to say Astaghfirullah. He looks at me and says, What? I said, You said Astaghfirullah for hitting the curb. He said, Did I? I said, Yes. What's wrong with you? He said, Oh, no, 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 no. Because I'm not saying Astaghfirullah because I hit the curb. I know it's not a sin. I'm not violating Allah's laws. I said, Then why did you say Astaghfirullah? Wallah, he said this word that I still remember it till today. He said, No, because when I was younger, I had this accident. I bumped into something. And I said a swear word. And I said to myself, Subhanallah, I shouldn't be like that. I need to get myself used to whenever I'm startled or in shock, I say words of dhikr. I program my brain to do that. Just like a person programs their, their brain to say swear words, you know how they, you know how it's programmed, right? Do you know how? How? Tell me. How, how do you get used to it? Why? Why? Because you... You hear someone else do it. All right, we hear our parents, and maybe not our parents, inshallah, no one here. Or we see it on TV. So as children, we behave as we see, we copy. That's how a child starts to swear. It's not born to swear. You can reprogram yourself so that your brain says words of dhikr instead of the swear word. So he says, every time I got shocked or startled, I say a word of dhikr. And this time he came out, astaghfirullah. I said, why? He said, because. Imagine I was shocked one day. I'm about to have an accident, but Allah, and I'm shocked. And I've programmed my mouth to say words of dhikr. 
and then I die after that accident. My last words will be words of dhikr. Isn't that amazing? That's the nurturing of the soul, ya akhi. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, يُبْعَثُ الْمَرْءُ عَلَى مَا مَاتَ عَلَيْهِ person will be gathered on the day of judgment on what they died upon. مَنْ كَانَ آخِرُ كَلَامِهِ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ Whoever's last words are لا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ will enter paradise. That's not literal. I'd like to make a, a note there. Not literal. And if you, someone dies and their last word is not لا إله إلا الله, it doesn't mean he's going to hellfire. Did you know the last words of the Prophet ﷺ himself were not لا إله إلا الله? Did you know that? Did you know that? Rasulullah's last words were not لا إله إلا الله. His last words were الصلاة الصلاة وما ملكت أيمانكم. Salat, Salat, and those whom you have been entrusted with. So it wasn't La ilaha illallah. But the, the context of it is that whoever dies while their habitual words are based on the meaning of La ilaha illallah. So whether it's Alhamdulillah, whether you're reading Quran, whether your last words were mostly, mostly words of dhikr, this means this was your this was your action, this is what you lived upon. Whose last words were la Allah, meaning their last belief and their last actions in their life, towards the end of their life, days, months, whatever they are, years, they were consistently upon the meaning of La ilaha illallah. So whether you say Astaghfirullah, whether you say nothing, whether you were, the last thing was prayer, even if your last words were something else. I love my mother, or I love my wife, or I love my child. It doesn't matter. Because generally speaking, what your last end, the parts of your life towards the end, were based on the teachings of La ilaha illallah. You're a muwahid, you were doing the actions that serve it. Anyway, the point is, brothers and sisters in Islam, to nurture your soul, get it used to dhikr. And one of the ways is that when it's startled or shocked, dhikr words. Most people die. With, we've heard about that last uh, drug, drug lord that died here in Sydney. Remember? What was his last words at the doorstep? Anyone read the paper? You're from Sydney, I'm from Melbourne, I read about it. You guys don't read about drugs, that's a good thing. I do. <laughs> so we read about this guy who died in, in Sydney and he was shot over drugs and things and he knocked on the door. His last words were some swear words, those effing whatever got me or something like that. We don't want our last words to be like that. Your soul needs to be nourished. And when your soul is nourished, your words are constantly dhikr. رَطِّبُوا لِسَانَكُمْ بِذِكْرِ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ said, uh, freshen your tongue always with dhikr of لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ So my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, your soul is your greatest gift and Islam is the greatest gift of guidance that keeps it protected, insha'Allah ta'ala. <coughs> Dhikr, dhikr, when you're standing, when you're sitting, when you're lying, lying down, before you go to sleep, after you wake up, when you eat, when you go, when you come, constantly on your tongue, insha'Allah, is what nourishes your soul and your happiness begins to rise. Now here is a beautiful gift hidden within this gift. This is the gem of the gift of Islam. You ready to hear it? The gem of the gift of Islam. You cannot enjoy the gift which Allah gave you until you are connected with the one who gave you that gift. Isn't that correct? When your parents give you a gift or you give your children a gift, what does that create? Relationship, good. See, I heard it from the child. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Tahadu, tahabu. Give gifts to each other, increase your love for one another. The reason Allah gave us the gift is because He loves you. And Allah wants you to know that He's always close to you. That's the clux of the meaning of this Islam. Why did Allah give us Islam? Because He wants you to know that He is close to you. Listen to what Allah said. 
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذا سألك عبادي عني فإني قريب أجيب دعوة الداعي إذا دعان فليستجيبوا لي وليؤمنوا بي لعلهم يرشدون which means and when my slaves ask you about me O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and when my slaves ask you about me I am close I am close I respond to every single request of the person who calls upon me. If they continue to call upon me. So let them respond to me. Let them come closer to me with my guidance, Islam. Let them respond to my call. And Allah has called us through the Quran and His Messenger. He calls us through His Islam. Let them respond to Islam. Let them respond to my gift. Let them accept my gift. All these meanings. Let them accept my gift. And let them put their absolute faith and trust secured in their heart towards me. Iman comes from Amn. Amn means security. And Allah called Iman from the word security, which means you cannot be a mu'min unless you are secure in your heart that Allah truly is your Lord and you trust Him. That's what Iman means. Let them accept my gift of Islam. Let them accept the call. And let them secure their faith in me in their heart. In the hope that they will reach what they yearn for. Yarshudun means that Allah will take care of all your problems and worries and requests that you want. Arrushd means to reach your goal that is good. Arrushd means to reach guidance. Arrushd, la'allahum yarshudun, means so that they may be guided to the place which brings them the happiness and success in this world and the next. Let's go back on it. وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي وَإِذَا means in English and if but إِذَا is different to if if means in or either in سَأَلَكَ or إِذَا سَأَلَكَ the difference between in سَأَلَكَ and إِذَا سَأَلَكَ they both in English means if is this in سألني means only if they ask about me. إذا is more open. Whenever they ask me. Constantly ask me. So Allah is telling us, ask about me all the time. Not just when you're in need. Not just when there is a problem. I want you to ask about me because I want you to have a relationship with me. I want you to know that I'm close to you. Always ask about me, always. And the best way to make dua, the best times to make dua, is when you don't really have a need. You just want to talk to Allah. We've forgotten that dua, closeness to Allah is just talking to Allah. If you love someone, don't you love to talk to them? Huh? If you love their company, don't you just talk to them, pick up the phone, you talk to them, isn't that correct? A wife always complains, my husband never talks to me. It means she loves you, ya akhi. And when she wants you to talk to you, and when she talks too much to you, it's because you love each other. Allah wants you to talk to Him. So that's why I use the word idha, which means always. Ask you about me, I want them to ask you about me. This is what I love them to do. I want them to ask you about me. Then Allah says something amazing. He does not say, then tell them that I am close. Then tell them. He doesn't say that. Naturally, if I say to someone, look, if someone asks you about me, then tell him that I love him. Isn't that, isn't that the proper sentence? But Allah doesn't say that. 
He didn't say, if they ask you about me, then tell them that I'm close. He said, if they ask you about me, I'm going to take the answer myself. My slave, I'm close. I've always been close. Directly, I'm going to talk to you. You know, like a king. If a king says to his uh, vizier, my people are asking about me. Can you go out onto the balcony and tell them that I love them? That's one way. And the people go, yeah. But when the king says, the people are asking about me, move out of my way. He comes out himself to the balcony and says, I love you all. Isn't there a big difference? Big difference. The intimacy is quite amazing, isn't it? Allah is saying, if they ask you about me, Ya Rasulullah, move out of the way. I will talk to them directly because this is what I love to say. I want to tell them. My slaves, I'm close. And I've always been close. And I always will be close. When you asked about me and didn't ask about me, I was always close. Whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim. There's a bit of a controversy over here. Some ulama said it's only the believers. Possibly. It has a point. But I say, Wallahu alam, according to some Mufassirun, even for the non-Muslims. Because how else does a non-Muslim repent? If Allah was not close, He wouldn't accept their repentance. Isn't that correct? Allah is always ready for any repentance. And when a non-Muslim becomes a Muslim, Allah is always there to hear him. As soon as they say the Shahada, He's there. When you make sin and you repent, He's there. There, always, always. Inni qareeb. I'm close. Ujibu da'wat al-da'i idha da'an. Now, here is another irregular sentence. When you say to someone, listen, if you ask me, I'll tell you. If you ask me, I'll give it to you. Isn't that what we say? If you say sorry, I'll forgive you. Isn't that correct? Isn't that correct? If you respect me, I'll respect you. Isn't that the proper sentence? There's some people that say, respect only those who respect you. I won't respect anyone until they respect me. So respect me and I'll respect you. That's the proper sentence, right? But Allah uses it in the other way around. He says, I respond to the caller. He gave the answer already. So he, he gave the answer before the question. He didn't say, if they are, when they call upon me, I will respond. That's the proper sentence. Allah said, no, I always respond. So long as they continue to ask about me. Because Allah's response is definite. It's definite. But your calling upon Him is not definite. It's unstable. You may ask, you may not. Allah is telling you, my response is always there. I will. The problem is you. You got to do your part. And again, Allah uses إِذَا دَعَانِ It doesn't say in da'an. If they call. إِذَا means I want my slave to always call upon me. Always. Didn't Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, مَنْ لَمْ يَسْأَلِ اللَّهَ يَغْضَبُ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ Whoever does not ask Allah, Allah will become angry with them. If you don't ask Allah, Allah becomes angry with you. What kind of love is this? If, you, if someone keeps asking you for things, what are you going to do to them in the end? Huh? Imagine everyone, someone coming up to your door. Uh, we've run out of sugar. Have you got any sugar? Give them sugar. Two hours later, knock. Listen, I want to water my garden. I've lost my hose. It's not working. Can I use your hose? You give him the hose. Comes back. Look, I forgot to fill up my car petrol. Do you have a tank that I can borrow? Fill up petrol? Yeah, you have a tank. Then he comes up to you. goes, hey, listen, I'm too tired to go to get the petrol in the tank. Can I use this hose to take some petrol out of your own car and put it in mine? And say, yes. <laughs> Come up to me and say, Listen, man, I can't be stuffed to go to the shops to buy some tomatoes. Your wife got any more tomatoes in there? Just give me a couple. In the end, what are you going to do to him? You're going to grab the tomato and throw it in his face. You're going to get the hose and whip him with it. Halal <laughs> every time you're coming asking for things. Sure, am I, am I your, have, you inherit, have you inherited me or something? Isn't that correct? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the opposite. He says, I will become angry with you if you don't consistently ask me. Allahu Akbar. La hawla wa la quwwata illa subhanaka ya ilahi ma ahlamaka wa ma arhamaka.
How merciful is Allah and how patient He is with us. He says, if you stop asking me, I will become angry with you. Who says that statement except someone who loves you immensely, beyond any measure? You ask and you ask and you ask. And Allah says, I will become angry if you stop asking. In fact, I will become angry with you if you do not insist and persist in your dua. Rasulullah said, Make dua to Allah and be consistent and persistent. This, my dear brothers and sisters, the point of this is, Allah who gave us the gift of Islam, He only gave it to you because He loves you. And Allah already dances you. I am close. I am close. The entire Quran is talking about intimacy between you and Allah. Now here is the question. How could one who loves you this much give you a gift that will not bring you happiness in this world and the next? Say Alhamdulillah. الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الله said say praise and gratitude to Allah who has guided us to this and would have never been guided if Allah did not guide us to it <laughs>